that. And I was just saying, <laughs> but basically, if you look at the people register, we've had 16 Benedicts, 23 Johns, Paul, six Pauls, we've had God knows how many Gregories, how many Clements. This is the first ever Francis. And we discovered not Francis Xavier, the great missionary explorer and bishop, but Francis of Assisi, il poverello of Assisi, Francis. We discovered that the guys from Argentina, despite his Italian name, actually he wasn't the president of the Italian Episcopal Conference, he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He's come from the global south. I think you cannot overestimate having a Pope who's been formed in the global south, the so-called two-thirds world. He's the first from over the transatlantic to come over here. We discover he's a religious. Do you know when was the last time we had a religious, no, a Pope who was a religious? I was going to say religious. We've got a few there. When was the last time we had a Pope who was religious? It was Gregory the Sixteenth. I know you all know he died in 1846. You, you knew that, didn't you? But you know what? He was a Camaldesian monk, and he was you know he was so you know what he was so bad tempered. He was so cranky and irritable. The cardinal swore never again will we have a Pope. Never uh, was a religious. Never again will we have a monk. But by 2013, they had forgotten. And so what do we have? A and not only is he religious, a Jesuit. You know, just next door to St. Peter's on the left, if you're looking at it, there's Borgo Santo Spirito, and there's the he general headquarters of the Jesuits, and the superior general of the Jesuits wears a black sutan, black, he's called the Black Pope. Mm -hmm. So now the Black Pope and the White Pope, they're both Jesuits. It's like a takeover. So a Perfect. Jesuit, a taking the name Francis from the global south, um, the great simplicity. <coughs> So we, we know so many, I, we haven't got time to go into the many. The man is a genius of gestures. And the man himself, I believe, is the message, is the style. But I just want to put it into context. Before we come to more familiar things, just, just to go back a little bit about his story. So, you know, he's born in 1936. His father is a migrant, an immigrant. His mother is of Italian origin, but born in Buenos Aires. He goes to the local primary school. He's educated then by the Salesians of Don Bosco. He goes into a kind of a technical, um, he wants to have a, maybe be a chemist or a chemical engineer. In 1953, on the Feast of St. Matthew, he has an experience. And walking past the church, he feels drawn to go in. He goes to confession. And whatever that priest said, whatever was his dilemma as an adolescent, it really touched him. And he felt, it felt a calling. That priest sadly died of cancer shortly afterwards. It was the feast of St. Matthew. And you know Matthew's vocation? Some of you have seen it in, in Rome, in San Luigi di Francesi, Caravaggio's, the you remember? Have you seen the beautiful picture by Caravaggio? And he goes, you mean me? You mean me? And Bergoglio was struck by St. Bede here up north in, in Jaro, his commentary on Matthew's Gospel, um, Miserando Acque Eligendo. So, me low and humble, yet chosen. God has shown me mercy and has chosen me. So he goes into the priest, goes to be a diocesan priest, but soon changed to become a Jesuit, goes to Chile, do his formation in Chile, goes back to Argentina, gets ordained on the 12th of December, 1969, and guess what? He's the first, first modern pope never to have been at the council. So he was uh, ordained, what, four years and five days after the end of the council. So never having been at the council, yet totally has he assimilated the teaching of those 16 documents. So ordained in 1969, he sent to, first uh, mission is to a school as a chaplain. And you know what? After only barely two years, they make him a novice master. Now in any religious order, I'm sure there's people here who know, to be a novice master, you know, it takes great qualities. So he's barely, just 33, 34, to be made the novice master of the Jesuits, and they do two year novitiates. But would you believe, just barely three years later, he's made the provincial superior of the Jesuits. Now, being the provincial superior of any order is very challenging. But can you imagine 1973, Argentina, Argentina with like 230 Jesuits? Could you imagine what it's like to be the provincial? And he's so young, he will be barely 36 when he took over. Later, he will say it's, it's madness. Now, what happened? What was his style of leadership? 
authoritarian, in charge, distant, never up close. Unfortunately, the province was very divided, maybe because of the previous provincial. There were factions in the province. This was the 1970s. You may have heard of liberation theologies in the plural. There were multiple liberation theologies. But what was the political situation of Argentina? You remember Peron, Peronism, and then the military coup, the military dictatorship? It was an incredibly hard time. And so many of the Jesuits had been working in the favelas, in the kind of the barrios, the slums, and would be getting political. People were being identified with liberation theology, with Marxism, the result of communism and the right-wing dictatorship, it was delicate. There's a sad case involving the Jesuits that two of it, have you seen the two popes? Mm. Have you seen the two popes? <laughs> well, forget what I'm going to say then. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but basically, sadly, two, two of the priests, as you know, um, Bergoglio, as the young provincial, said, you've got to come back into community, back into mainstream. And they resisted. Uh, so a second time he goes and says, <clears throat> and then the third time, under obedience, they refused to come back. To the following Sunday, the secret police, a dawn raid, attacked them, kidnapped them, abducted them, and for eight months were held with hugs. They were beaten, they were stripped, they were drugged, all kinds of things. And thanks be to God, they were released after eight months, stripped naked, left on the side of the road with hugs on them. One of them sadly died without ever forgiving Bergoglio. The other is alive, and has forget actually they discovered they blamed Bergoglio for giving their names to the police. We discovered later on a young collaborator with the with the resistance had been captured, tortured, and under torture had revealed their names. It wasn't Bergoglio. But sadly one died thinking. So however, he's provincial, very, very difficult. He does six years. Authoritarian, distant. Actually, if you look at the photographs, he's glum, he's miserable, he very Certainly he's into charity, he goes around a chauffeur-driven car, but authoritarian, severe, glum and distant. You getting the message? He finishes that. What do you do with provincials when they finish? And he was only 42. So they made him the rector at Collegio Maximo, the seminary of philosophy and theology, where he had his philosophy of education, which was going the opposite direction from the new administration. So he's on collision course with them. And what happens? He um, basically stands on toes, rattles cages, becomes again unpopular. He finishes his six years, and there's now a division in the province. Those for him, the, the Bergoglio is, you know, those, are inside, those against him. So what happens? The regime want to get rid of him. So when you want to get rid of somebody, what you do? Send them to do a doctorate. So that's what we do. So, so that's, that's what you do, uh, Anthony. That's how you do a And so he went to Germany, and beautifully he chose a figure called Romano Guardini, who, despite his Italian name, was a great, you know, philosophy, theology, spirituality, a man of the Christliche Weltanschauung, Christian worldview. He's doing the doctorate, he loves it, but you know what? He's profoundly homesick for Argentina. Uninvited, he decides to go back to Argentina. Uninvited, not a good move. He comes back and they make him, they give him a symbolic job as procurator. The superior general of the Jesuits, the black pope in Rome, uh, Peter Hans Kolvenbach, intervenes and says to the present provincial, get rid of him. So here you are, the man who was the novice master, the man who was the provincial, the man that was the rector of Collegio Maximo, now aged 54, is banished into exile. So when you want to send somebody in exile, what do you always do in every country? Send them up north. <laughs> always. Blackburn, places like that. <laughs> they were just randomly chosen. Randomly chosen. <laughs> and what, um, so he goes to a place called Cordoba. Cordoba. It's about 720 kilometers northwest of Buenos Aires. He's in the community there which is a kind of a residence next to a church. And would you believe this? He is forbidden any public ministry. So we're in the year 1990. He's given a very plain, simple room on the ground floor with a stark a table, a chair, a desk, a wardrobe, with a window overlooking the bus stop. 
his major source of entertainment was looking at the people at the bus stop outside. And there, his major mission is hearing confessions, celebrating private masses. But here's the thing, there, there are certainly alleging he's not allowed to receive all the phone calls. His phone calls were certainly intercepted. Of course, there was no mobile phones. There was a reception desk downstairs. And the system was, if the phone was for you, three, three long pulls on the bell. You know, in these convents, you have bells for the sister so-and-so or father so-and-so. So maybe he did miss some of the phone calls, but calls were intercepted. His correspondence was censored. So for two years, he's in limbo, forbidden to write, lecture, publish. This was the dark night of the soul. This was 1990, 1992 in Cordoba, when he's at his lowest point, when he, when he was banished, when he was in exile, when his self-worth was, you can imagine the crisis. So what happens? Um, he's a, he takes this, how ironic, 30, 20 years earlier, that was the place of his own novitiate. He had done his own novitiate in Cordoba, so this is his second time around. And so he's there in Siberia in exile, and a phone call goes, and he hears the bells, and he goes down. And who's on the other end of the call? The apostolic nuncio. And the nuncio says, I want to meet you tomorrow at the airport. I'm going to another town. I'm coming from Buenos Aires. I'll make an escala. I'm going to make a stop over. I want to meet you. Now, as provincial, he had been consulted about the suitability of people for future bishops, you know? You need to get a lowdown on who they are. So this is what he's expecting. The next day, he goes to the airport in Cordoba. He meets the apostolic nuncio. They sit in a coffee place. They're there for about 25 minutes, and they do indeed discuss two com com possible Jesuit, two possible people being bishops. The nuncio gets up to go, says, I have to catch this other plane to get back. Oh, and by the way, he says, Pope John Paul wants to make you the auxiliary of Buenos Aires. The nuncio kept it to his last 90 seconds. The man was stunned. And so, in a sense, how did this happen? The Archbishop Quarantino, earlier on, had sent priests on retreats to the Jesuit provincial, giving spiritual retreats to priests, and he was impressed by the caliber of Bergoglio. So what happened? Quarantino, he's got four, if not five auxiliaries already, massive place in Buenos Aires. He wanted, he wanted Bergoglio. The Jesuits blocked it. You know, you're consulted before you become a bishop, you might not know it, but people are asked, and the, the, the super, Quarantino went to Rome himself and got the ear of Pope John Paul. You know, when the Pope decides, so the phone call, you're going to be the auxiliary. 1992, he comes back to Buenos Aires. The residence he chooses is in the favela, in, in a barrio. And just like any parish priest, he gets to know his territories by walking the street. Now, no chauffeur-driven car. Now, no palatial uh, residence, just an apartment in the street in the home, contact with the people. It, it's phenomenal to see his presence and availability to people where they are at. He speaks their language, he speaks the vernacular. So he's there, and guess what? There, I've told you five auxiliaries, in number six. The following year, the, the Cardinal Archbishop makes him the Vicar General. So he, he's the junior bishop, he now becomes the senior over the other auxiliaries. And the strategies all through the 90s of being with the people, a popular kind of theology. In 1997, Quarantino petitions Rome and Bergoglio is made what we call coadjutor, the coadjutor archbishop, meaning the auxiliary, the bishop designated who has a right to succession. 1998, or 97 still, uh, he dies, Quarantino. And guess what? Bergoglio becomes the archbishop of Buenos Aires. Certainly by 98. 2001, he's made a cardinal by John Paul II, 2001. 2005, April, John Paul dies. There's a new conclave. April the 19th, Ratzinger becomes Benedict the 16th. But guess what, in that conclave, the, the cardinals take a vow of secrecy, and guess what, we know what the outcome was. And Bergoglio was second to Ratzinger. So, where has this man come from? Where has this man come from? This authoritarian, distant, cold, dictator, severe leader now becomes Pope. But 
Cordoba before and Cordoba after, there's a transformation. That man, by the grace of God, with the dark night of the soul, got in touch with his own identity and with the gospel. And the major ideas we're seeing in this pontificate have matured through, through the 90s. So what do we see in his first week? In his first weeks, you might have heard of the revolution of tenderness. These gestures of simplicity, of, of loving compassion and kindness. You know, he's in, by the way, he chose not to live in the papal apartments. Not that they're very luxurious, but he said, I would die of loneliness if I stayed there. And so he stays in Casa Santa Marta. You can see him with his tray in the queue, in the cafeteria. How about that? The first night he was there, there's these Swiss guards outside his door, his room. He opens the door and says, what are you doing there? Holy Father, we're gu guarding you. So he goes in and comes out with two chairs and says, well, at least sit down while you're guarding me. Little gestures we, we can see all the time. But he was elected on the 13th of March. The 13th of April, he set up his first cabinet of eight consultants, eight cardinals. Now, most of us here, I mean, you were all probably born at the time of John Paul II, but there's probably one or two of us that can go back to Pius XII. There's at least two of us in the room that go back to Pius XII. <laughs> Just be honest. <laughs> and up to Pius XII, you know the word monarchy, monos arche. Monos, one, arche, the rule of one. Our popes have been monarchical. They have been up to this man. The popes have been papa rei. They've been kings. They've been emperors. An emperor, imperial style of being pope. Now we have a new style with this man. So the first thing of leadership is not to be monos arche. If you're a leader, you cannot be a one-man band doing it all by yourself. So with four weeks of into the job, by the way, Forgive me. When he was then himself the Archbishop and Cardinal of uh, Buenos Aires, he had himself five or six auxiliaries. Every two weeks he met with the six others. So every two weeks he met with the seven of them together. And four times a year he met with his council of priests. Four times a year for consultation. So four weeks into being Pope, he has the, what we call the C8, the Gang of Eight, Cardinals, which then became nine, and one from every continent, from North America, from South America, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from Oceania, and from the Vatican. So uh, there were eight, and then he had appointed this unknown guy called Pietro Parolin, who was in Venezuela, uh, as his Secretary of State. So he got rid of the one who was there before, a guy called Bertoni, who was a Salesian. I'm gonna, I'll come to this in a minute. You need your own team. Anybody going for leadership, you cannot be by yourself, but you also need the right team, and people need to be on board. So he has a group that becomes C9. Uh, you know some of the names. Sean O'Malley from Boston, yeah? George Pell from Australia. Gracias from India. Cardinal Archbishop of Kinshasa, the guy from Chile. Uh, Reinhold Marx from, uh, from, from Germany. Uh, Parolin himself and another Italian. So you've got these. But then, here's the thing. Yeah, looking at you. There's probably at least one Italian in the room. Yeah, we love Italians, and we love Italians. We love food, we love Italian drink, we love the country. We love everything about Italy, except there are too many of them running the church. So the Pope had to have a strategy of de-Italianizing the Curia, the Curia, but also the College of Cardinals. So just very quickly, Pope Paul VI, one of the heroes of Pope Benedict, made some rules in the 1960s. The College of Cardinals should be kept around 120 voters, and when you reach the age of 80, you have to retire and you lose your right. So normally, it's very easy to track from 1960s. Usually every three years is what we call a consistory, and there are new cardinals, always. Now, Bergoglio, how old was he when he became Pope? Well, he was 76 in three months. You know, normally you have to retire when you're 75, offer your resignation at least to resign when you're 75. So on his 12th of December, he wrote uh, when he was 75, his letter of resignation. Benedict XVI never accepted it. And when he arrived in Rome, by the way, on the papal desk in the office, he found his letter of resignation, which, which unlike Nancy Pelosi, um, <laughs> up, but the Pope just tore it, didn't accept it. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, he was 76 and years of age and three months when he began a, a mission, a ministry of leading how many people? 
1.1 billion human beings. He's 76. What's the point I'm getting at? His clock is ticking away. And so he knows he's got limited time. So he's not going to wait every three years to have, like the others, a consistory of cardinals. So he goes for every year. So we've had a, we've had a consistory every year. So up to a few minutes ago, he's, he's named 88 cardinals. He's appointed 88 cardinals. 67 of them are electors. So he's kind of filling the college with his people, not necessarily thinking the same as him, because you need creative tension in leadership. So he has creative opposites, but very respectful. So guess what? In 2013, when there was a, the conclave, how many countries on planet Earth could vote for the Pope? Well, you know, only 48. If he dies tomorrow and there's a conclave next week, how many countries will be able to vote? 65. Because out of his 88 new cardinals, 67 electors, 17 come from countries <coughs> who have never, ever had a cardinal in their life. So this is part of his vision. So my friends, first point in leadership. Those of you taking, nobody's taking up. Oh, you wanted to. Okay, Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision, the people perish. Where there's no vision, the people wilt. Well, there's no vision, people die. You need vision. What's a vision? A vision is a snapshot of the future which fills you with passion and enthusiasm now. It's to do with directionality. Where are you taking your school? Where are you taking your department? Where would you like it to be? What fills you with passion and enthusiasm? So Bergoglio, filled with passion and enthusiasm, his directionality, his choice of who he wants in the College of Cardinals and College of Consultors for dialogue, consultation and sharing is going to be governed by his vision, by his vision. So these, these guys, 17 countries that never had a cardinal before, where did he go to? The peripheries. He went to the edges. He went to Kataholos, the Catholic Church, universal according to the whole. Only 648 countries voted for the last cardinal, Pope, now 65 already. And so, you know, you know in certain countries, there's uh, metropolitan sees with archbishops, and traditionally you always become a cardinal. Have, have you noticed that? Well, that was the case for the last 400 years, but no longer. Um, what's the biggest Catholic diocese in America? Los Angeles, thank you. Do you think the Archbishop of Los Angeles is a cardinal? No way, Jose. And his name is Thomas Jose Gomez. No, no. All right, have you ever heard of Philadelphia? Since 1870, the Archbishop of Philadelphia has always been a cardinal. Guess what? No more. Do you ever, looking at you, you look as though you, you do watch a lot of Netflix and television. So you've seen Sopranos. Sopranos, yes. So you know Newark, Newark, New Jersey? So the Bishop of Newark, New Jersey is a cardinal, for God's sake. Newark, New Jersey is a cardinal. Indianapolis. The Bishop of Indianapolis, a cardinal. Los Angeles, no. Philadelphia, no. Let's come nearer home. After Rome, what's the biggest populated diocese in, in Italy? Milan. Do you think the Archbishop of Milan is a cardinal? No, he ain't. Instead, where was the first trip Pope Francis went to at being made Pope? What was his first pastoral visit? Lampedusa. Off the coast of Sicily, nearer to Libya. Guess what? The Bishop of Milan is not a cardinal. The Bishop of Agrigento, Lampedusa, <coughs> is a cardinal. Are you listening to this, folks? Do you know where the earthquake was in Aquila? Aquila, center of Italy, Abruzzi. The Bishop of, of, of Aquila is a cardinal. In the last batch in 2013, Matteo Zuppi, Zuppi from Bologna, with Sant'Egidio, is a cardinal. Venice had to wait, Turin had to wait. My friends, it gets worse. What's the capital of Haiti? Port-au-Prince. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Archbishop of Port-au-Prince is a cardinal? Thank no, you. he ain't. I, I get the logic. 80 kilometers down the road is a diocese called Le Caille, and a young guy called Chabris in his early 50s, he is the cardinal, and the archbishop of the capital city is not. It gets worse. What's one of the latest, one of the latest saints that a pope has made? Thank you, Oscar Romero. Where does he live? El Salvador. What's the capital? Do you think the bishop of San Salvador is a cardinal? No, he ain't, but his auxiliary is. Excuse me? Excuse me? You make the auxiliary a cardinal? You know, uh, there, was, there was a book in 1910, How to uh, Influence People and Win Friends. 
Francis never read it. Because the number of enemies he's making is, is incredible. So here's the point. Uh, these cardinals from all over the place. Where the hell is Tonga? That Tonga, the Maori school there, where's Tonga? A population of 150,000. The bishop there is now a cardinal. Excuse me, have you heard of the country of Laos? 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 How many dioceses in Laos? Trick question. There's no diocese. It's a vicariate. And the vicar, the vicar general there is now a cardinal. This pope was one of the smallest countries in Central Africa. Bongi, Central African Republic. Who's the youngest cardinal in the world? Dieu Donne and Zapalanga. Anyway, this is St. Mary's Trophy. I don't expect you to be educated. <laughs> okay, so he's the youngest. Guess what? He's born after. This is not being recorded. He's born after the Vatican Council. He's come from the poorest country in Central Africa. Uh, Bongi, Central African Republic. My friends, he's gone to the peripheries. He's gone to the extreme to give a voice to the poor, to give a voice to the voiceless, and to experience being the universal, uh, universality of the church. He started off so popular, front page of Time magazine, Rolling Stone magazine, Advocate magazine, everybody loved him. The honeymoon came to an abrupt stop by 2016. 2016, four cardinals write a public letter against him, called the Dubia. Walter Brand, Brandmuller, Joachim Meissner, uh, Carlo Cafara and Raymond Burke accusing the Pope basically, well no, this is with doubts over Amoris Letizia. Guess what? Guess what? Of the four, two of them are dead. Be careful when you attack the Pope. <laughs> two of them are already dead. So the, the following year, the following year, would you believe 62 academics, clerics and philosophers, lay and cleric, write a letter of filial correction, filial correction to the Pope, accusing him of heresy. Is the Pope Catholic? And they accuse him of heresy. A very distinguished uh, American Capuchin doctor of theology, um, Thomas Vinandi, wrote an open letter to the Pope in 2017, saying, Holy Father, you are filling people with, with confusion, chronic confusion, and you're guilty of moral and doctrinal chaos, approving, you know, accusing the Pope. Uh, last year, 2019, again, a whole group of academics including somebody from this country, a Dominican a prolific writer whose name I will not mention, signed a letter accusing the Pope of heresy. My friends, there is so much resistance and so much opposition which has become ferocious. I don't want to lead you into temptation, but there are right-wing Catholic blogs. Sadly, just very quickly, you know Michael Boris? You, you've heard of perhaps Church Militant, LifeSite News, um, even more moderate things like EWTN. Mm. Um, there's this Italian lay people who are really great, who've turned into uh, um, Sandro Magister, uh, Antonio Socci. There is a whole campaign. There's a, there's a Sede Vacantius. There's a whole group of Catholics saying the Sea of Peter is empty, and what? Benedict is really the Pope. This man is not the Pope. They're accusing Bergoglio of being the Antichrist. There's vitriolic, fierce attacks against him incredible opposition and resistance. Right, as a leader, when people attack you, when people resist you, when people refuse to go with you, how do you react? How does the goal you react? By silence, by silence, by refusing to join in the power game, by, by, by not that he's stubborn in the bad sense, but by clinging to this vision that he has of, of the gospel and of doggedly, of his, his tenacity, his tenacity, his resilience, he's unperturbed, he's unfazed, he's unfrazzled by it. It lets him go over because he's convinced. So what's his secret? He's got a vision. He's got a core conviction. He's got his team. So his immediate associates are mm -hmm. Pietro Parolin. Parolin. Parolin, he's the Secretary of State. The young guy from Liverpool, Paul Gallagher. He's younger than me, that's why I'm saying he's a young guy. So Paul Gallagher from Liverpool, he's the, the foreign secretary. Paul Gallagher, the new head of Propaganda Fidei, the propagation of the faith, is Chito um, Tal, um, Tagli from, you know, Antonio Tagli from, from the Philippines. So he's got Tagli in place, he's got, uh, he's got Gallagher, he's got uh, Parolin, and he's got Antonio Spadaro, this Jesuit, He's got his own team and advisors, his vision. Where's his blueprint? 
Where's the vision? Where's the strategy? Evangelium Gaudium. What, what he did in the November the, 20, the Feast of Christ the King in 2013. So he's got a strategy. He's got a strategic plan. The joy of the gospel. So his, his vision, his blueprint, he knows where he's going. He's got the team that he wants. He, he's got his, his way of re, re, replying to the criticisms um, that are trying to, this coup d'etat. They want him to resign. They want him to go. The man is 83 years and two months. Sorry, those of you in the room over 80, just stand up. <laughs> oh, no, no, false humility. <laughs> listen, listen, the man never stopped. Now, he's not a good example because he doesn't take a holiday, he doesn't take a day off. But the energy and the stamina is on kind of one lung. He, walk, you know, he doesn't wear red shoes like only the devil wears Prada. And he wears black orthopedic shoes. He trudges along, but he's dogged, he's, he's unrelenting in his vision and his fidelity to himself. But what's the point about his leadership? There's been a met, there's been a, a met, yes, a metanoia, a transformation of him. If the younger, authoritarian, provincial, severe and distant, look at this new man. How would I describe his style? What's his style? Well, he's upfront and close. He's in the mix of people. He's spontaneous. He's natural, he's unaffected, he's simple. You know, if you look at the way he speaks, look at the way he shakes the hand. Five minutes, that's great, because I, I, I thought I had to finish. Right, as I was saying at the beginning then. Um, <laughs> look at his style, look at his style. Look at the way he shakes the hand of his secretaries. Look at the way he greets the, the interpreters. Uh, John Paul was great, Ratzinger was great. They would walk past secretaries and guards, Swiss guards. This guy greets them. This man is present. This man makes contact. This man is available. This man never stops. This man gets it wrong and can say it. Just recently, it went viral. Slapping is the woman that grabbed him, you know, on, on the 31st uh, of December, San Silvestro slapped him. He, she slapped, he slapped her. This week, they've had an audience together. He's apologizing. By the way, I take my hat off to him. You know, he hit that woman because she grabbed him and the next day from the balcony, he apologized. <coughs> to be able to say, I'm sorry, he apologized. That's a sign of leadership. She just had an audience with him this week. Sadly, in Chile, he made a terrible mistake over Bishop Varios. Huge mistake. Terribly wrong. He apologized. When have we ever had a Pope who's apologized for personal, who says he's got it wrong? To be able to say you're sorry. To be able not to take yourself too seriously. To be able to laugh and smile. When you meet him, he looks into your eyes. When, when you meet him, he's there for you. He's not looking over your shoulder. So my friends, in his own philosophy of education, he has so much to say about teachers. Precisely that often it's the contact that is more important than the content. That relationships transform. That people in teaching, it's a vocation, it's a ministry, it's a calling to be signals of transcendence. He, his own words are to be openers of new horizons, to, to generate hope, to be a window into what is above. And it begins, as you can tell, with the joy of the gospel. Number one, his first strategy, a personal relationship with Jesus of Nazareth. You as a teacher, you as a head, your personal relationship with Jesus of Nazareth you discovered you are loved infinitely, unconditionally, absolutely. That can only result in joy. So encounter, encuentro, personal. You, you know you are loved. You then are filled with joy. And what is it? His whole thing is radiation, attraction. He has a missiology of attraction. There's no proselytism. There's no forcing. There's no imposing. There's no coercion. It's by, as you know, what did Paul VI say, his great hero? What people need today is not teachers, but witnesses. Mm. And we will listen to teachers if, our, first of all, they are witnesses. So what does a witness mean? It's by your integrity, your credibility, you radiate coherence and meaning. You're filled with joy, your relationship with Christ, person-centered, uh, into contact rather than content, into relationship. Anybody can instruct, anybody can indoctrinate. Education is a miracle. It's one-to-one. -one. It's the person of the teacher committed to the person in front of them. And so uh, he has so many wonderful things to say, which I certainly haven't done justice to. But his simplicity, 
his naturalness, he's able to smile, he's able to laugh, his, his availability, his vision, he's not being unperturbed, unfrazzled by, by criticism, and get the right team, um, wow. I think leaders in schools, there is so much that we can learn from him. And I don't want to abuse your time, but thank you for taking the time to be with me this morning.